This is a production of Cornell University. So uh, my, my last department seminar was actually on the 19th of February. I, I looked it up uh, in 2020. So I was close to being the, kind of the closing act before, uh, before COVID uh, shut us down and we kind of went to an all virtual world. So I'm, I'm happy that's over, hopefully. And, and I'm glad to be back at least to some degree in front of a live audience after two years of, of pretty much talking to my cat at home. We got a kitten at the start of the pandemic and she's been uh, pretty much my sounding board for uh, research areas for the last two years. So my seminar today, I'm gonna pick up sort of where I left off two years ago. Um, I'm going to include just enough review for those of you who are, who are the more recent arrivals you've gotten here in the last two years. Um, so I'm going to talk about where we are today in the research on light uh, to suppress plant diseases. Uh, some of you have heard uh, about the work on uh, grapes and other crops, possibly on strawberries. It's been in the news lately. Um, what you might not have seen is the overall scope of the project, uh, which involves test sites on diverse crops uh, around the US and overseas. Uh, it's a big project involving many people. My job is really to function as the kind of project director and uh, public relations for, uh, for the group of scientists that's spread across several institutions and countries and corporations. So a lot of the work I'm gonna be presenting today was actually done by other people on that research team. But as the project coordinator, if you're really interested in the peer reviewed papers in the area, uh, popular articles, posters, uh, contact information for any of the people involved, uh, videos, educational resources, uh, visits to the various test sites around the world or across the country. Uh, training and collaborative opportunities. If you're interested in the work, you want to try it out on your particular path of system. I'm able to provide all of that, so, uh, so please contact me. So let's get started. I want to try to put this work into some kind of uh, temporal perspective. I've, I've used this slide before. It never gets old for me, uh, possibly because the Tyrannosaurus is over 201 million years old before I uh, started using it. Uh, it's around even before I arrived at Cornell. Microbial pathogens have a 100 million year head start on the Tyrannosaurus. So they've been attacking plants for a very long time. Uh, they have a huge head start on humans. <laughs> All right, okay, so here we go. This is, the, this is the slide I wanted to get up for about the last four minutes. So these are two adjacent greenhouses um, attached to Barton Lab, photographed them just after sunset. Now there's substantial diversity um, uh, among lighting systems and spectral distribution. And I just wanted to reinforce that uh, that just as you can see a difference in the spectral distribution, the color of light here, fungal plant pathogens have photosensory and regulatory systems, and they, they respond differentially to different parts of the visible spectrum. Now, anytime you move a crop into an environment like this, powdery mildews can become uh, your number one problem. Uh, the conventional wisdom is that this exacerbation of powdery mildews is due to more favorable temperatures and relative humidity in, inside of these uh, controlled environments. We now know that much of that consequent increase is really caused by fundamental changes uh, to sunlight that are caused uh, primarily by the exclusion of uh, natural solar UV and by the way we use supplemental lighting. There, there's nothing in the evolutionary biology of powdery mildews or other plant pathogens that equips them to deal with the spectral changes caused by the, the imposition of glass or plastic between them and the sun, or um, likewise, their, their evolutionary, evolutionary biology is shaped by the rising and setting of the sun, not by electric lighting that has a temporal and spectral distribution that is, um, when viewed from an evolutionary time scale, it's, it's totally unfamiliar to these pathogens. I mean, we, we could also spend some time 
uh, discussing how to disrupt photoregulatory systems that control pathogen growth and sporulation. Uh, solid state LEDs, for example, allow you to do something with light that most pathogens have never seen before. And that's, that's counterphasing or alternating uh, different wavelengths. So instead of red with blue, as they would see in natural lighting, pathogens can see red and blue alternately or out of phase. Uh, and with LEDs, you can do that thousands of times in a single second. You're acting upon the phytochrome and cryptochrome systems uh, in opposition rather than in synchrony. And if we did that, if I covered all that material, uh, we'd be here for a very long time. That's really three different seminars. So today we're gonna just talk about one of those evolutionary uh, traits and see how we can use it against a pathogen. And that one trait is, uh, is really how they deal with ultraviolet light. So, I mean, above ground pathogens live in a world that's bathed in sunlight. Now, ultraviolet light is a part of the natural solar spectrum and ultraviolet light causes damage to a pathogen's DNA. Now, despite the occurrence of that damage, pathogens can thrive in natural solar uh, UV because they possess systems that can repair that damage to their DNA just about as fast as it occurs. Those DNA repair uh, mechanisms are dependent on blue light. They're recharged by blue light. They don't operate during darkness. And that last little fact is the key to using UV successfully to suppress a plant pathogen. Now, a real breakthrough occurred about 10 years ago when a PhD student named Rupalai Sukaparan uh, on the research team in Norway discovered that applying UV light uh, at night was much more effective in killing a powdery mildew on cucumber plants uh, than when it was applied in daylight. In effect, applying UV at night bypasses the pathogen's ability to repair the damage to its DNA. That discovery allowed us to use about 10% of the dose of UV that's required during daylight to achieve the same degree of kill uh, in a microorganism. Now, we now know that nighttime UV applications are similarly more effective against many pathogens and at a dose that's far below uh, that which causes any damage to the plant. So you can read all about the biochemical and genetic aspects of this phenomenon if you really want to in excruciating detail. There's a lot written about it. The bottom line for practical purposes is that uh, for pathogens such as powdery mildews, which are in this slide, uh, and many other organisms, they're simply not adapted to deal with UV at night. And that means we can kill them with a fraction of the dose that's required uh, during daylight. Now our initial trials uh, targeted various powdery mildews because they are on the outside of the plant. That makes them an easy target. Uh, they're especially vulnerable to UV. Uh, but we've since found ways uh, to use UV against other diseases and even arthropod pests. So I want to go back in time a bit uh, to the early 1990s, because I think this particular part of the work is a fitting example of just how far we've come uh, in this research area. But the gentleman seated on this tractor is uh, named Al Michalowski. Uh, he's passed away now, but uh, he was an engineer who retired from research and worked on industrial photocopiers that use UV light. Uh, he approached Bob Seam and I in 1991 with this kind of crazy idea that ultraviolet light might actually control uh, grapevine diseases because that interested him because in his retirement, uh, he had decided to kind of kick back and uh, slow down, relax and do something really easy. He was gonna grow wine grapes in upstate New York. Um, this is the tractor drawn array of germicidal uh, UVC lamps. Uh, that came out of that early collaboration to suppress powdery mildew on, on grapevines. The UV treatments were quite effective. Uh, they also made the grapes look a little bit like um, small russeted potatoes and they defoliated the vines. So, uh, well, if you're gonna fail, by all means fail fast. So uh, this was not the response we had hoped for. And we kind of walked away from this area of research uh, for several years after that. And, worked on other things. So, so kind of fast forward 
um, about 30 years. And we're presently on the threshold of an entirely new approach to controlling plant diseases. And we got there because we have a much better understanding now of pathogen biology and pathogen ecology. And because of the pooled engineering and physics and manufacturing expertise of this large, uh, diverse project team. The discovery of the enhanced efficacy of nighttime UV was part of that, uh, but there were a number of other refinements as well. Now, strawberries are the crop in which we worked at a lot of the bugs out of the system. Um, so I'll spend a little time on strawberry before we move on to grapes and some other crops. So this picture shows the basic design of the UV uh, lamp array that we designed in 2016 for the first large scale uh, commercial uh, trials on strawberries. Over each row, there's a hemi-cylindrical bank of 20 UVC lamps. They're backed by polished aluminum reflectors. That densely packed array of lamps and reflectors provides a very large number of reflectance angles. And that turns out to be quite important. Dose throughout that three-dimensional space uh, under the tunnel is very uniform irrespective of the distance of a particular leaf or fruit uh, to the nearest lamp. So it's mostly diffuse radiation, not direct. The multiple reflectance angles also mean there's improved exposure of the undersurfaces of many of the leaves and fruit. This unit was operated uh, at a commercial strawberry farm in Florida in 2017. The dose that we used was 85 joules per square meter, and the applications were made twice a week, starting about an hour after sunset. The tractor speed was just under three miles per hour. And this is going to be a short video clip uh, showing what it looks like underneath one of the units during one of the nighttime applications. Now you can see the hemicylindrical banks of UVC lamps and the reflectors over each row of plants. The power for the lamps was supplied by a small generator. Now, this was a unit that we designed, uh, but it was entirely built and operated by the farm crew uh, at the research site. These are not terribly difficult machines to build. And the treatments actually work uh, very well. Uh, in fact, the dose of UV that we used provided suppression of powdery mildew across the duration of, of the entire growing season that was substantially better than the best fungicide uh, combination that we used in the trial, which was a combination of two materials called uh, Quintec and Torino. We also confirmed that the UV treatments didn't reduce plant size and they didn't reduce the yield of harvested berries. Also important. Now this is a video of what we call the Dragon 2.0. Uh, this is a tractor drawn unit that's now in operation at a place called Fancy Farm in Plant City, Florida, uh, at the center of uh, Eastern strawberry production. It looks a little bit less like a runaway tool shed. Uh, you can see how we're getting closer to something that might resemble a commercial production unit. After years of building these things, we have a large enough footprint in multiple crops that we've attracted the attention of equipment manufacturers. Uh, that was our intent. Uh, I personally and so other members of the research team want to get out of the business of building these things and get stay in the business of discovery. That's, that's really what we do best. We're not a manufacturing concern. We've expanded the strawberry trials in Florida and elsewhere in North America and in Europe. Uh, some of the most intense interest uh, in the UV technology actually comes from strawberry nursery operations because they're under uh, really tremendous pressure to reduce fungicide use because nursery operators need to prevent the distribution of plants that harbor pathogens that are pre-selected uh, for high levels of fungicide resistance. So whatever fungicide you use in the nursery, it's very likely it's going to be also used in the fruit production field. But you can imagine the potential for disaster if plants that harbor a pre-selected pathogen population are then treated with the fungicide for which the prior selection occurred in the nursery. Uh, and so we're collaborating with some of the larger nursery operations on both coasts of North America. This is the largest unit we've designed to date, uh, and it's presently being used in a place called Keddie Nurseries in Kentville, Nova Scotia. 
It has 90 uh, UV lamps arrayed in three separate eight foot long arrays that cover three five foot wide beds of strawberry nursery plants. It can move up to five miles per hour. It's pretty fast for a tractor that you have to drive at night. We call this one smog after the fire breathing dragon in Lord of the Rings. Uh, point of showing this to you is that the technology is scalable. It's adaptable and these UV arrays can be configured for uh, really any number of canopy architectures. Now, in addition to the tractor drawn units, there are fully autonomous robotic carriages that can move these UV lamp arrays either in field settings or inside of high tunnels or, or greenhouses. Our principal collaborator in this work has been Saga Robotics. It's a Norwegian company, but we work with other robotics companies as well. This image shows one of the high tunnel trials in Norway. Uh, the results from Europe, where they have even more severe problems with fungicide resistance and fewer fungicide options have been pretty consistent. The UV treatments effectively suppress powdery mildew and in most cases, they can perform as well or better uh, than the best available fungicides. So I think with reference to strawberry powdery mildew, we're, we're beyond the point where we have to worry about whether or not the technology is going to provide control of strawberry powdery mildew. It, it actually works quite well. The Saga robot is called uh, Torvald. It's an interesting device. It takes uh, a basic lamp array and allows us to adapt it uh, to any variety of fruit crops, including strawberries, grapes, uh, apples, even hops, uh, by varying the height and width uh, of the lamp array and the carriage. The Torvald robot is fully autonomous, uh, meaning that where it's allowed by law, it can navigate these plantings without uh, the involvement of a, a human operator or monitor. These devices are presently, they're largely one-off custom built units. Uh, they're probably within about a year of being commercially available, either as a, uh, a unit for purchase or as a, a leased unit with technical support. Uh, I mean, like everything else that's been manufactured during a global pandemic. Uh, Saga Robotics is not unique. It's challenged by any number of choke points in their supply and distribution chains. So this has been, uh, this has been a delay, but not, uh, not an insurmountable obstacle. As I mentioned a moment ago, we're kind of trying to stay in the business of discovery, not manufacturing. So one of the more recent refinements in the technology has been the addition of UV reflective curtains to the front and back of the lamp arrays. That, that may not sound like much, but it takes a very special fabric. It's, it's not that easy to reflect UV. In fact, it's the same reflective material that's used in Navy firefighter suits for shipboard fires. Uh, it's a bit pricey. It boosts the UV dose, however, by about 30%, and it provides even better coverage of the otherwise shaded uh, parts of the canopy under the array. That means we can both go faster and at the same time, uh, get improved coverage of the otherwise uh, shaded parts of the canopy. That 30% boost in irradiance under the array translates directly into a 30% increase in ground speed and a corresponding decrease in the fixed costs as you spread them across 30% more acreage. And that's all for the price of a, you know, a few yards of shiny cloth. And that kind of innovation in developing the various uh, different types of uh, mobile arrays in lamps is now occurring in several locations, both in the US and elsewhere, where mobile booms and track units and these autonomous robots are being used to move these lamp arrays either within plant production structures or in field plantings uh, for a number of different crops. Now, during the late winter of 2019 to 2020, uh, just about a month before everything hit the fan with respect to COVID-19, I was in the Pacific Northwest. Anyway, I was in the Pacific Northwest, Delaware, uh, Washington, Wolverhampton, Corvallis, Oregon, okay. uh, working on design
The year before that, in 2019, whoops, that to advance. So we had conventional uh, tractor drawn units in New York treating grapevines uh, with, uh, and as well as low trellis tops. And in 2020, we had two of the Torvald robotic units uh, from Saga working in vineyards in the Finger Lakes region. We had those two, uh, those same two robotic units uh, in New York again in 2021, as well as additional units in Oregon and another one in Italy. We'll have those two uh, Torvald robotic units uh, in California this year, uh, and they should also be commercially available, as I said, about uh, 2023. Now, showing applicability of the UV technology across several crops is how we get the attention of equipment manufacturers. It's also how we reduce the costs of producing the units. There's another good reason to work on several uh, fronts simultaneously because by doing so, that's how we make new discoveries in the basic biology, the epidemiology, uh, which transcend uh, the specifics of a particular crop or a particular pest or disease. They may have uh, very broad applications uh, to many crops. These, these machines and the technology, it has a certain cool factor. Uh, they're undeniably fun to watch at night. They're, they're kind of pretty. But it's the research on the epidemiology, the pathogen ecology, photobiology that makes these machines work. I'm gonna give you a couple of quick examples of that. So fire blight of apple and pear is, it's one of the most destructive diseases on tree fruit uh, worldwide. In fact, it's the principal reason why the California pear industry is a, a tiny fraction of what it was in the 1980s. Uh, fire blight pretty much eliminated it. There are very few sustainably effective antibiotics that can be used against this bacterial pathogen and alternatives to antibiotics are sometimes minimally effective. There was no real reason to expect that UV applications would be uh, much better than that. Uh, the bacterium, like most others, has a remarkably fast reproductive rate, and we would have expected that it would have rebounded uh, quite quickly after a UV exposure, even if we were able uh, to reduce the bacterial populations with UV. When we tried it last spring in a collaborative study with Carrick Cox's program, it actually reduced the disease to trace levels and it performed as well as anything else uh, in the trial. Uh, we don't understand yet how this is accomplished. That's gonna come later, uh, but it was nonetheless highly effective. Here's another example uh, from a collaborative study with Sarah Pethy Bridges program. The, the cell walls of the fungus that causes Cercospora, uh, leaf spot on beets, uh, they're heavily pigmented and, and melanized. Now, presumably that provides a robust defense against uh, natural solar UV. We were still able to suppress the disease using weekly nighttime applications of UV. The dose required was considerably higher uh, than what we use on grapevines, uh, but it didn't damage the beet foliage to the point of reducing yield. Uh, and it certainly didn't damage the foliage to the degree that Cercospora does if it's not controlled. Um, the discovery here was that what we presume to be a barrier to UV is, is not really absolute. You can overcome it uh, at UV doses that are still not harmful to the crop. And that pattern uh, keeps repeating in diverse trials where we've conducted uh, that, well, where the more we do, the, the more we learn. You never know what you're gonna see until you look. Now, here's another example from a collaborative study with Lance Cato Davidson, uh, David Combs, and Katie. <laughs> this experiment began in 2019, uh, with really with grape pottery mildew being the target. Uh, but we found that UV treatments were also controlling sour rot, uh, and they were controlling that to a degree that was, that was quite surprising, better than many other things that we were using. Now, sour rot's a complex mess involving bacteria and fruit feeding insects and fungi. 
all working together in a kind of a splendid cooperation uh, to rot grapes. Now, here again, we don't understand yet how UV is accomplishing uh, this reduction. That, that's going to come later. The point is it was not only very effective, but it, it was in many ways unexpected. Now, neither did we expect that UV treatments would necessarily be effective against the downy mildew pathogen as it represents a, a comparatively uh, challenging target. It's actually inside uh, the grape leaves and the fruit. But lab assays uh, that were started by Surya Sapkota in our lab showed that the pretreatment of grapevine leaves made them resistant to infection for several days afterwards. Now, this was the first time we'd seen disease suppression that was caused by UV increasing the resistance of the host to infection. Now, it's, it's one thing to see an effect like that in the lab. It's not always something that you can reproduce in the field. And so we, we got bold and we decided to run a field trial on Chardonnay uh, during the 2020 growing season. Probably guess where this is going. Had we stopped with the laboratory studies, we probably would have been a lot happier uh, because 2020 turned out to be one of the more severe years uh, for downy mildew on record and none of our UV treatments provided suppression of the disease under vineyard conditions. Katie, I'm sorry for what I did to your grapevines. <laughs> Still living it down. Uh, the UV treatments worked fine against powdery mildew. They just didn't have the degree of efficacy needed to completely control downy mildew as a standalone treatment on a highly susceptible cultivar in a severe disease year. That doesn't mean it has no effect. It simply means we're likely to find a place for this uh, in an IPM program as a method that supplements uh, and improves the performance of other measures uh, in suppressing uh, this particular pathogen. And in fact, that's, that's exactly what we were able to do uh, when we paired UV treatments with host resistance in 2021 on the hybrid cultivar vignoles. That's only moderately susceptible to downy mildew and it wasn't as severe a year. On vignoles, UV applications reduced the severity of downy mildew on the foliage uh, by about 75%. So uh, while UV seems unlikely to perform well as a standalone treatment against downy mildew on a variety like Chardonnay, uh, People put a lot of things in a spray tank and on grapevines that do less than provide a 75% improvement in the performance of a control program. So these partially effective forms of suppression uh, can still be very useful in the overall context of an IPM program. Now here's one more example of a somewhat unexpected effect uh, that's immediately relevant to, to many different crops. Uh, cooperative studies with Jan Nyrop's lab uh, and other labs in Norway demonstrated that low level nighttime doses of UV actually effectively destroy uh, the eggs of various mite species that attack a broad range of important plants, uh, both in controlled environments uh, and in field production systems. Now, this suppression has been very consistent and the technique is now widely used uh, in commercial strawberry production in the Netherlands, where everything's grown under glass. The primary effect of the UV applications is on the immature stages, and in particular, the egg stage. And that damage to the egg stage is actually seen to some degree in the future generations. We're just now beginning to understand how UV treatments might affect other uh, insect and arthropod populations. There's, there are other research groups uh, in the US and elsewhere that are independently investigating the use of UVC against botrytis, gray mold, of strawberry, and grape. And they have reported some modest degree of, uh, of suppression. Uh, we haven't been able to reproduce those results in our trials on either strawberries or grapes. That doesn't mean the situation is hopeless. It may just indicate we have more to do with respect to timing of treatments and dose and interactions with environmental favorability and cultivar susceptibility, just as we found uh, with downy mildew on grapevine. So this graph shows the first trials we completed using weekly nighttime applications of UV to suppress powdery mildew on Chardonnay grapevines in 2019. There are a lot of people now focused on this specific area of research, 
it's really the combined solution of all of these plant pathological, photobiological, and engineering issues that separates a, a usable, uh, effective, and safe apparatus from that vineyard fryer that we, uh, we developed in 1991. Now, I don't think that UV is going to be you know, the, the solution to all of our problems. I do think we're at a stage where these kinds of discoveries are occurring at a greatly accelerated pace, just because of the number of people working on it and the number of trials going on. So things are happening at a pace faster than once every 29 years. And as we gain more experience with these trials, we consistently improve the performance of UV against all powdery mildews uh, to the point where the efficacy often uh, equals the efficacy of a number of fungicide standards. So these are the results from 2020, uh, showing the best performing of the UV treatments uh, against great powdery mildew on Chardonnay fruit. In trials in commercial Chardonnay vineyards, uh, there's generally a, a history of good disease with canopy then constantly lower pressure. We've been able to press powdery mildew trials uh, to price level on both foliage proof weekly application of UV at either 100 or 200 per meter. You can ask why would we why would we do the using rather than added in current with too much tools? And the answer is that you all use dose by ground speed. And so half the dose is traveling twice as fast, covering twice the acreage. At our plant density, we have about a mile of row per acre. Uh, so five miles per hour, uh, you can use five. And even on the shortest night here around Boston, uh, you can do 20 acres um, at that speed. Since the robots work uh, seven nights a week, up to night, uh, you can cover a lot of single robot uh, in one week time. So we're often asked, uh, well, how long of a dark period do you need after the UV treatment? And we generally recommend about four hours. However, in those instances where you're near the summer solstice and the nights can be quite short, um, our results indicate you could probably push that out to about two hours before sunrise and still get most of the efficacy of that UV treatment. In those situations, we'd suggest that you simply, for the last two hours of treatment, that you, the dose be applied at a, a progressively higher level to offset that decline in efficacy. Uh, due to having less than four hours of darkness remaining. So this is a challenge, uh, but there's a practical solution. We're also asked uh, questions about the possible effects of UV on, on fruit appearance and, and quality, in particular with wine grapes. Of course, high rates of, uh, of UV can russet the fruit, damage the vines. Uh, we proved that in 1991. Uh, but we're using less than 10% of the UV dose now that we used in 1991. And we've really yet to see an effect on fruit finish. So I want you to take a good look at these, uh, these Chardonnay grapes and try to pick out the ones that are treated with UV uh, and which ones are treated with a fungicide stand. That's long enough. <laughs> it's not obvious. We found no differences in berry size, finish, berry number, uh, weight per cluster uh, between the UV treated and the fungicide treated grapes. Likewise, there were no differences um, in soluble solid levels um, among the UV treated and fungicide treated grapes. So it does appear we're operating at or below the level uh, where we might damage the plants, but at a level that provides very good suppression, uh, at least of powdery mildew. So this is a very busy graph, uh, but it conveys a, a, a simple message. We monitored uh, 20 different metabolic responses of grapevines for two consecutive seasons on vines that were treated with 200 joules per square meter and on untreated vines. Now, if you take any one of those responses on the treated versus the untreated, and you divide it by the value for UVs, uh, UVC by the value for the control, 
um, you get a ratio. If the ratio is equal to one, uh, it's not significantly different from one, then the values are equal and there's no treatment effect. So this is a way of comparing a lot of different treatments that occur on multiple scales on a single graph and seeing if there's any real, uh, any outstanding differences. So with respect to the broad range of responses associated with uh, photosynthesis, and respiration, and electron transport, leaf thickness, chlorophyll content, absorbance at eight different wavelengths, none of these was significantly affected, uh, even at the highest doses of UV uh, that we used. We're also asked um, how, how does UV application affect microbial populations on the surface of the grapevine leaves and the fruit? And so far, these, these very preliminary studies in looking at total culturable fungi and bacteria, it does appear we're we are reducing the populations uh, by about 50% immediately after the UV application. We also know that these populations rebound in a matter of days. Uh, there's nothing in the data that we've collected so far, and it's, it's, it's actually quite limited, but it doesn't suggest that there's any residual or long-term effect of UV applications on these surface inhabitants. And that's, that's quite a different situation from the use of a fungicide, where it might not only crash the microbial population, but it would leave a, a residue a longer lasting effect that might still be detectable in some cases at harvest. Well, okay. What can we say with a fair degree of certainty about the uses of UV on grapevine? Well, first we're confident we can achieve excellent suppression of powdery mildew. We've done this on uh, several crops other than grapevine and the results from grapevine have been uh, quite consistent. The same goes for mites. It doesn't seem to matter what they lay their eggs on. Uh, we've been able to kill them with UV. Next, we've achieved good suppression of sour rot, which is, that's good news because we don't have a lot of other things that will effectively and reliably control this disease complex. Uh, next, there's partial suppression of downy mildew, where the degree of suppression could be advantageously combined uh, with host resistance and fungicide. As for botrytis, uh, we haven't seen a measurable uh, suppression on either strawberry or grape, um, but we haven't given up yet. Now, as for the effects on the vine itself, uh, it does appear that even at the highest doses and most frequent applications, we're operating at a level uh, below the level of UV that would cause harmful effects on either the foliage or the fruit. Now, that's not entirely surprising because that's exactly what we found in strawberries and cucurbits and apples and roses, tomatoes, hops, basil, and rosemary. Uh, in grapes, we've measured the effects on leaf length and width, shoot extension, net photosynthesis, stress metabolites, berry size, and so on. None of those responses indicated the harmful effect of UV, and there are obviously a number of benefits uh, with respect to suppressing those things that would certainly otherwise harm the vine. Now, I started this story trying to describe just how many people are working together to, to move this research forward. Well, here, here are those people, uh, both the, uh, our research team uh, and the project advisory group. Now, in, in this photo, going from right, your left to right, okay, is Laura Peterson, uh, probably known to many of you. Uh, she's a former extension educator, now growing a lot of acres of vegetable crops uh, in the Geneva area. Uh, Eric Seidman, uh, near her, is a former director of the Northeast Organic Farmers Association. They both advised the project. In Eric's case, despite the fact that he and I shared an office together as graduate students at the University of New Hampshire, he still speaks to me. That's a Rupalai Sutha parent uh, standing beside Arna Stensvank. Uh, there are two members of the research team from Norway. Uh, next are uh, Mariana Figuero and Mark Ray, uh, two research team members from, of all places, the Light and Health Center at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. Uh, you can combine their names with Light and they'll fill up about the first three pages of a Google search uh, so that they do some fascinating work. I'd encourage you to look them up. They work on human health as well. Beside me is Ole Mirna. He's a 
project advisor who is a strawberry grower in Norway. He's a mechanical engineer and he's an inventor and a member of the project team. Uh, I'm sorry, project advisory team. Rebecca Seidman, uh, beside him, is a professor of organic agriculture, again, at the University of New Hampshire, a member of the project advisory team, and married to Eric. Bob Seam, of course, is my longtime uh, colleague, co-conspirator, and supervisor at Cornell. Uh, in the bottom row is Natalia Perez, uh, a professor at the University of Florida, who's the project lead for on all things having to do with strawberry. Uh, next to her is her former graduate student, uh, Rodrigo Onofre. He's now an assistant professor at Kansas State University. Lance Cadle Davidson is, of course, uh, a great uh, geneticist at USDA right here, Cornell. Um, and he's responsible for overseeing all of the work on grapevine uh, below the cellular level. Next up is Jan Nairov, who is our main contact in working on the effects of UV with arthropod pests. And then next would be Walt Mahaffey and Michelle Moyer, two grape pathologists at uh, USDA at Corvallis and uh, Washington State University at Prosser, uh, respectively. And lastly, the newest member of the team is Katie Gold, who's joined the research team and brings to the table an entirely new set of uh, skills extending far beyond visible light into, into the hyperspectral region. So my role is really just is the, the kind of the spokesperson for the project. I consider my job to be to get you interested in this work, uh, keep you interested in this work at least long enough that you'll ask me some questions about it. So we're gonna stop here. I apologize for the technical difficulties they are due to me. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions from either the group here or the remote uh, location. So thank you for your attention. Uh, you've been a, it's great to be back. David, this is Chris. Uh, I'm gonna read uh, two questions from chat and then you can take a couple from the room. Uh, if you wanna stop sharing, that might help. Um, uh, Elizabeth Buck asks, uh, when you were talking about uh, not using UV two hours before dawn, um, she was saying uh, like actual sunrise or more like uh, civil, civil twilight? Um, we actually begin the applications at civil twilight. So you could probably consider civil twilight to be the, the, the starting point for um, when the, the applications would be ineffective. So you can use civil twilight. That for those of you who don't know what civil twilight is, that's about 30 minutes before sunrise. And, and then, uh, great talk. I was wondering what is the interaction of UV and fungicide application? Do you think UV application may facilitate the uh, evolving of uh, fungicide or antibiotic resistant isolates or shift the fungal population structure? definitely has the potential to shift the population structure, uh, but the populations are shifting all the time anyway. So I don't know if the UV applications cause a specific shift. With respect to resistance, UVC lamps have been used in medical applications for about 75 years, mostly against bacterial pathogens, surface contaminants, human pathogens. There are no known examples of resistance to UV light or a direct link between the use of UV for sterilization in something like operating rooms and the occurrence of antibiotic resistant strains. So it's possible. There isn't any direct evidence to show that it's been happening. So this, this question has been raised many times in human pathology. Uh, we're just, we're way behind them in plant pathology. So I don't have a definite answer to that. All I can say is point towards hospitals and say, it's not happening there. Great. Uh, questions in the room? I can't see the room. In the back. Why do you need um, the few hours of darkness after a treatment for it to be effective? Okay, the question was, why is there darkness required after the treatment in order for it to be effective? And the reason is because of this photolyzed uh, blue light driven repair mechanism. 
You can kill them with daylight applications, but it takes a lot more UV, 10 times the amount that it takes at night, because during daylight, they can fix the damage to the DNA as fast as it occurs. Syria. Uh, David, uh, first, I want to let you know why I'm sitting in the corner, because the, the UV worked great for uh, powder autonomy in the lab, but did not work in the field. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm being threatened here. Yeah, so when you take the example of the beet, do you, do you think if we increase the doses uh, for the grapes in the vineyard, we might get better control for the down milieu? That's, is that a possibility? I don't think you really want to increase the dose a lot beyond 200 joules on grapevine. So different crops will respond differently to the same dose of UV. Grapes can tolerate 200 joules per square meter, they can tolerate that dose multiple times per week. Tomatoes are damaged at 50 joules. Beets can tolerate 400, 500, 600 joules per square meter. You have to look at each crop individually. So do I think that if we increase the UV dose on grapevine that we would get better control of downy? Possibly. Killing the vine is not a good way to control an obligate parasite. So we've done that experiment in 1991. Yes. When you were testing to see if UV would be effective against downy in the field, were you applying the UV pre-symptomatically or once symptoms had already shown up based on those results in the lab where it was more effective pre-infection or pre Yeah. When the field, you're doing both by default. You, you don't have a control over natural infection periods. And so, yes, you're using it before infection and after infection. And you don't really know with precision which one's happening. We do know it didn't work for it. <laughs> we proved that. Katie. Um, so if I remember correctly, one thing that Dave noted in the 2019 trials with sour was that he noted that there was more botrytis in the UV treatments. And I wonder if that's because botrytis and sour rot compete for the same niche. Like last year in our trials, we saw because sour rot was so severe, we had very little botrytis. Do you think that there's any other um, pathosystems where you might see that sort of thing happening? Like, you know, where you clear out something that is targeted by UV, but then you accidentally like clear open a niche for something else. So the question was, in the initial trials on the control of sour rot, there was an increase in the level of botrytis. Do we think that by controlling one disease with UV, we might open up an avenue for an increased uh, severity of a second disease? So in the 2019 trial, there was a slight elevation of botrytis in that trial. In 2021, there wasn't. So could it happen? Yes, the effect was rather mild. Uh, we could say it's significant or non-significant depending on the probability level we choose. So it was a difference, uh, but it, it wasn't reproduced. This is still a relatively new area of research. So we don't have other examples of that uh, to, to go by. We've got it in several different pathosystems. We haven't seen that occur yet. Maybe it hasn't happened yet. Chris, are there more questions from Ithaca? Yeah, sorry, uh, in chat, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, Robert Richter, um, have you measured TDN levels in fermented wine? I, I have read that, uh, I personally, Chris, read that TDN causes a uh, petrol flavor in Riesling. <laughs> oh, right. Sounds delicious. And if they cut off our Russian gas, perhaps we can, <laughs> we can use that. But. <laughs> Um, we have not made wine out of these grapes yet. Uh, that is going to come probably in the next year or so. So I don't have an answer for that question. Uh, Gillian asks, has anyone tried this uh, experiment with a circadian clock mutant of the pathogen? Um, there have been a number of experiments where people have messed up the circadian clock of various fungi uh, using uh, false dawn and other tricks that you can do with light. Uh, with counterphasing, uh, most of the work has been done in plant systems, not in fungal systems. That would be interesting. Gillian, did you wanna? Okay. <laughs> 
Um, Marjorie uh, asks, is it better for full foliage to be blown around when applying UV in the field in order to increase exposure under the surface? And then Elizabeth adds on to that, is canopy structure a limiting factor in large leaf cucurbits? In one published paper where someone has actually looked at this experimentally, uh, having fans on the array actually made things worse probably by dispersing the pathogen. But that's, that's, that might be a peculiar system in, uh, for, a, for a greenhouse. Uh, probably the easiest way to access uh, otherwise shaded parts of the canopy is not to move the canopy, because as you move the canopy, you're simply changing what's shaded. So prop, the, the best a way pro to probably approach that is getting the most reflectance angles that you can uh, to come at the canopy from several different angles. And that's what we do with the front back reflectors and those that entirely reflective surface on the inside of that arch. So it's not something that we couldn't try in the one case where it's been tried, it actually made things worse. And in the last question from chat, uh, how long were the vines followed to determine the effects of UV on the vines over a season and years? We've done this now for uh, multiple locations for three successive years. We're not looking at things like return bloom. I mean, grape vines are treated pretty harshly by the people that grow them. You cut off a lot of a grapevine. Uh, you remove probably 20% or more of the canopy as a management practice uh, during the summer. So they experience a lot of defoliation uh, simply from the vineyard manager. All right, any other questions? One more question from the room and then you can stay, but then we're gonna cut this off. One more question. And if not? They want to leave. All right. <laughs> All right, well, let's thank David for a great seminar. Well done. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.